I'm very much excited to be with you today. This is probably within my top three presentations of the year. And I will, there will be a moment when I will explain to you why I think this, this talk is so important. In short, it's because I think there, we have two groups of people who um, are long overdue to do stuff together. And, and so that's going to be the overlining, the underlining um, theme of my talk. Now, we began this morning with Jan talking about the, four, um, the fourth paradigm and how the paradigm shift is in fact is affecting various branches of research and science. Now, I just wanted to add two aspects to that. One is, in my personal view, this is really changing every area of, well, life, if you think about it, okay? And the second one is, as those breakthroughs happen in computer science, in humanities, in life sciences, in environmental studies, I have a feeling that those areas are coming closer and closer together. In other words, because of the breakthroughs in the individual disciplines, we have more and more excuses to do things together. There are more and more amazing things that can be accomplished if the various groups that historically have not been working so closely together do. Okay? Um, there's also a personal reason why I'm very much excited that now high performance computing and computer science is coming into the arts and humanities. And this is coming back to Emiliano's argument. You know, are artists and the humanities guys so much different from the scientist guys? Well, at least some of them are not, okay? Because I happen to have a musical education, I enjoy playing music a lot. Um, and I remember of my studies in the UK in the Birmingham Conservatoire, where we also have seen that now we have access to, uh, well, recordings, just to pick one example. When I started my saxophone education, I would go to um, Polish um, annual saxophone workshops because people would have tapes, okay? And we would copy music so that we could listen to people that we've never heard of, okay? And now we can just, uh, through various media, not just get access to music, but there are people who start to write software which hel helps you to decompose solos of various artists. And a friend of mine recently has done a PhD where he actually encapsulates the style of a particular artist, a, a particular jazz musician, by taking the music uh, from his solos, from the recordings, and is able to generate solos in the style of that particular person. Okay? So um, I really think that th it is really high time that computer science and the arts and humanities start to work together. Um, because for many years people were wondering how come I have uh, computer science and also musical education. I hope you will agree that there are more similarities than differences, um, and, so, and so, so that is yet another reason why I feel excited. Now, the outline of my talk is going to be rather simple. We have talked a lot about managing data today. We have talked a lot about archives, repositories, making data available. Now, ICM has close to 200 people and a 20-year-old history. We do a lot of stuff. I will not cover all of it today. In fact, I would want to focus today on a particular aspect of our activity, which is high performance computing, okay? And I know we've spoken most of the day regarding the digital in digital humanities, that this is a relatively new thing, that there are many challenges, that this is something that is just beginning. Well, imagine high performance computing being the formula one of IT. You can imagine it's even worse than that. But still, I'm going to give you some examples of how other high performance computing centers have approached this topic over the recent years. Then I'm going to tell you why I really think this is high time that we do something together in that area. Now, I deliberately left uh, out some things that are happening in Europe because we had a great voice from Italy, from Britain, from Germany, from uh, the Netherlands. So rather than showing you how European high performance computing centers are doing it, I took a look overseas. Um, the high performance computing community is relying heavily on um, the funding from the American government. We apply technologies that have been developed uh, based on contracts with the Department of Energy, of DARPA, etc. So I think it is justified that I will show you how the high performance, high performance computing community overseas um, is tackling the, 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 the very exciting area of applying high performance computing to the digital, the digital humanities. So I started looking. And uh, by all means, I don't want to discuss with you the definition of humanities, but uh, hopefully it's accurate because it's been around for 50 years in the US. Um, the reason I'm showing you this quote is this is actually taken directly from the um, National Endowments from Humanities Act signed over 50 years ago by the Johnson administration. And the NEH is the place where I went looking first. So some of you may be aware of the NEH. Anybody aware? Following? Perfect. Thank you, Martin, for saving me. Um, 
If you take a closer look of what they actually do, you will actually see that for them, high performance computing is also an area of priority. And truth be told, not many uh, people from the humanities and arts have so far been able to successfully use high performance computing to a very large ex extent. But there are proof points, which I will discuss with you shortly. And this is, a, um, this is an area which both sides are regarding as a very interesting next step to one another's progress in their respective domains, okay? In the high-performance computing domain, uh, historically, we've started in some areas of science and we've expanded to new ones. And I feel that this is a very important moment for our community where we take on new challenges from our side, okay? Because we have to deal with new kinds of data, we have new kinds of use cases, new algorithms have to be constructed, etc. But I also believe that from the other side, from the side of you lot, yeah, from the humanities and arts community, there are also some new interesting opportunities that can, that can be derived from the fact that we can now apply those kind of methodologies. So once again, the reason why I mention um, uh, the NEH is that they, a few years ago, they started a targeted program to make available high performance computing infrastructure of the Department of Energy of the United States to apply it for humanities and arts projects. And I'm going to give you just a couple of examples, in fact, three. Um, one of those examples is the Perseus Digital Library, which to my best knowledge was one of the first instances over in the US where people started digging into the semantics of the texts that are being, uh, that are being uh, collected there. So not, not, not just to do metadata and extraction, but also to try to get into the um, bodies of the scientific publications of the, of the text that they had in order to get an understanding of what, the, what, what it is all about. And text mining is going to be a, a, a theme to which I will come back in a second. Um, the other example is in uh, imaging, if you will. Yeah? So reconstruction of scans of, uh, of Michelangelo's statues and to learn how we can best manipulate them, how we can compare them between one another, and how we can use the fact that we have learned a lot from manipulating volumetric images in a completely different field than the arts and how much can be drawn from, from applying it to studying sculptures. And finally, um, the last example is from the San Diego Supercomputing Center where there was a project which was bringing together different kinds of data, old texts, old statistical data, so that we can start not just making available um, different data sets of different structures of different origins, but actually try to aggregate them, try to run analysis on top of it. Okay? So um, just some, some, some early, early experiences. We've talked about text mining. We've talked about volumetric imaging. We've talked about linking different kinds of data to, um, to draw conclusions. Another example which I wanted to show to you is what's happening north uh, and up in Canada, because there the Sharknet, um, so the scientific shared academic research computing network, uh, um, has done their, let's say, iteration of trying to apply high performance computing to the humanities. And they came to the conclusion that there are essentially two areas which are worth looking at, one of them being text mining, text analysis, the other one being manipulating and analyzing rich media. And again, this is not a surprise, um, because we have known how to use text mining in other areas, and it's only logical that we start to um, also make use of that in the, in the, in the humanities. And also, like, like the other example that I have mentioned, manipulating volumetric imaging, browsing through sets of uh, 3D objects, comparing them between one another, or using the newest technology for rendering, analyzing, <coughs> Um, rich media is also, is also uh, well, not a surprise. Um, the one thing I will come back to in just a second is that especially in this second area, so in the rich media, rich content area, it is important that one has to facilitate um, many users in parallel that are going to be manipulating the same data sets. But again, I will come back to this in a second. And traditionally, again, three examples. One of them, the Monk project, was an idea to play around with the possibility to, um, to visualize in three-dimensional space connections between publications. So imagine that your desk has just gotten really too crowded, and you can think of a 
uh, three-dimensional desk and try to put these images in three-dimensional space one uh, to one another. Of course, as soon as you start doing that, you need to have different kinds of algorithms in order for that to be working quickly, smoothly, etc., etc. Um, the other example is in this multimedia space. This is the Gridcast project. Again, I know we are way over schedule, so I will just give you pointers. I will leave a copy of these slides with you, and they will be on SlideShare for you to follow up. And finally, um, a nice example for those of you who like to study architecture. Um, this is, again, an idea to which I will come back. The possibility of rendering architecture uh, like it used to be in different weather conditions, in different moments of the day, or just simply to, to allow people to take a virtual tour of old buildings, of old cities. This is, again, a nice possibility made possible by advances in computer science and high-performance computing in particular. And again, this can be, this can be uh, applied quite interestingly to the arts and humanities. Um, I promised to come back to the fact that making available large data sets and mechanisms to manipulate those large data sets to a large group of people is important. Um, another conclusion of the activities conducted at SharkNet was, well, okay, let's take a look at the showstoppers. Let's take a look at why the adoption of high-performance computing in the um, arts and humanities is not that uh, quick, if you will. Yeah. If you think of high-performance computing in the traditional way, we used to be very batch processing oriented, okay? So somebody had a problem, a problem that required large computations. They would give us a task, they would give us some data. We would go back and crunch the numbers, and then we would come back to them with a result. Now, the kind of use cases that the humanities and arts are bringing to the table require a different kind of approach. You need to be able to work interactively with the data, and so we had to do our homework how to present algorithms, tools, infrastructure in a way that is more digestible to the community of the humanities and arts. So, so, so um, those massively multi-user online environments, MMOs, like, like the people at Sharknet started calling them, this is indeed a challenge. This is something where a lot of research went into. And I'm happy to report that um, a lot of, a lot of me members of the, of the high-performance high computing community, including our center, have become um, a lot wiser over the last few years. I could quote many examples of services that ICM is providing to really a large number of users. But for the sake of time, you will have to trust me. Or you will have to ask me lots of questions, which I encourage at the end of the presentation. So I told you about the NEH. Then we went north to Canada, okay, to SharkNet. Now we are going down again, and we are going to something called the Institute for Computing in Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. Honest question. Did anybody in this room hear about this organization or this institute? Nobody, okay? Um, to those of you who are somehow connected to the high performance community, did anybody hear of the NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications? I see a few hands, yeah. So this is an important one because not only is it one of the larger supercomputing centers in the US, this is where the Blue Waters project funded by DARPA, the High Productivity Computing Systems Project, um, has its home. Okay, so DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project or uh, administration in the US, is sometimes funding nice things like the internet or other things that we know. In this case, when everybody was excited that supercomputers broke another barrier of one petaflop, yeah, DARPA said, well, it's great that you've been able to break this record. Well, why don't you show to me that you can actually do productive stuff with those kinds of tools? And this is exactly what they have done, okay? Now, the, this, I don't know how to, whether it's ICHAS or ICAS, I like to say that this is the Institute for Computing in Humanities and Social Sciences. This is actually a collaboration between the NCSA and the University of Illinois. And as the name suggests, they only do things related to the humanities, arts, and social sciences, okay? So you have the spotlight of the world's high-performance computing community on productivity saying, look guys, we really have to do something in the arts and humanities and social sciences. I found this to be important, that's why I'm taking your precious time to share this with you. Just two examples, if I may. One of them is related to cartography. Now, 
I was expecting a lot of projects to be mentioned in the previous talks, and I was not uh, wrong, because we mentioned that archaeological data, for example, is the fastest growing and the largest data set so far. There are many interesting projects also happening in Europe. Something I do not have a slide on is an interesting project in the UK called Democrata, which is home at the Darsby Laboratory at the Hartree Center, where people are analyzing maps, old maps, and reports of archaeological findings to be able to predict whether a construction site is going to incur the problem of finding some archaeological finds. Now, everybody is very happy that we find something, but uh, you have to realize that for the people who are commissioned to build the building, this is really bad news, and they are wasting a lot of money because of delays, okay? So there was a project which was digging into the um, data sets of, like I said, uh, reports of historical findings, uh, information about where tribes were migrating, where tribes were settling, to try to do a prediction, what is the probability that when we are going to build this particular building, there is going to be the risk of finding some archaeological finds. But never mind that, I do not have a slide on this, so this is just me letting you know that some interesting stuff is also happening in Europe. Um, uh, the work that I'm showing here is, 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 is work uh, conducted by Michael Simon. This was analyzing old maps of the Great Lakes. Um, not because we think that people um, were not very uh, good at making maps in the past, and that's the reason why the old maps are different from the new ones, but chances are that something that was depicted on a map 100 years ago, 200 years ago, carries important information. For example, information about the water levels in the Great Lakes, or what the outline of those lakes has been. So I find this is, this is, this is quite an interesting one, because again, we are analyzing cartography images, old drawings, to try to draw conclusions about the state of the environment 100, 200 years ago. One example, uh, if you want to have more information, links are provided. The other one, which, which, which I like, is, you know, people get told off by their loved ones for spending too much time in front of the computer. Apparently, in Korea, they are now banning uh, being uh, in an internet cafe between, I think it's 3 o'clock in the morning at 9 o'clock a.m., because people were spending so much time uh, playing those massively multiplayer online games, that there have been cases where people died of starvation in front of the computer. There is also some good stuff, good stuff for science and research that can come of it, because this is a great field in which we can study human behavior. Um, the systems facilitating those virtual wor 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 worlds are recording every activity of every user, and we can do some very interesting studies, like how people interact with one another, what's important to the people, how structures, social structures are being formed. Um, most of those kinds of um, systems uh, allow creativity of users where they can make stuff up. People create objects which can then be sold. So this is a big mind of, uh, big mine, I'm sorry, of, of interesting um, information. And the Virtual World Exploratorium, a project that is still going on, if you're interested in those kinds of analyses, I encourage you to take a look at it, is analyzing the most uh, commonly used uh, massively multiplayer online role-playing games um, with the goal of drawing conclusions about the behavior of people. So, I've shown you three examples of how the HPC community over in America is doing things. The last thing I will show you before I jump over to what we are doing here at ICN is um, what you see behind me. So, how this Institute for Computations, Computing in Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences is helping people from the Arts and Humanities and Social Sciences to do work together with them. And they, and they do essentially four things. Okay? They provide resources, so infrastructure, tools, etc., for those people to use. They are facilitating research in making available tools of researchers which can help people to make use of that infrastructure in conducting their research. Finally, they do education, they do training opportunities, and they also help them in getting funding for the research that they do. So, we said that not really many people so far that this is a really niche thing, a very elite thing, where the humanities and arts can really benefit from high-performance computing. But we have some proof points, okay? I told you that the areas that we should be looking at is text mining, visualization, and systems that can make data available to a large group of people with lots and lots of requirements. So, so now I come to why we're really here, why I'm really here today, um, namely to tell you about the effects of, 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 of the ocean or ocean project. And again, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could tell you that we have some interesting infrastructure, 
that we have some interesting teams of people that in those three box, aforementioned boxes um, have really knowledge and uh, would be willing to do projects together with you. And finally, that we have an idea how this collaboration could work. Well, you have guessed it. This is exactly what I'm about to tell you. So regarding infrastructure, I mean, I'm a graduate of the Warsaw University of Technology of Computer Science, so I could spend two hours explaining to you why the infrastructure that we have is awesome, but I will spare you this. Um, let me just briefly mention that we have some cool toys okay, on the ground. Currently, the installation is finishing. We are now populating the systems with data, and they will be available in the spring. We have some interesting infrastructure to conduct large-scale simulations and graph analysis. We have dedicated infrastructure for big data processing. So whenever we hear big data and data science, yes, we've got the toys to facilitate that. Um, we've been talking all day about the data, so yes, we have infrastructure to archive, make available, process large quantities of data. And finally, we also have uh, a state-of-the-art large-scale visualization facility, um, which we can use to either play around with new interfaces, new use cases, or facilitate work of people with those large data sets. So we do have the infrastructure, but that's not the thing that I'm personally most proud of. The thing that I am most proud of are the teams of people that we have on board that are looking for new challenges, looking for new areas to get engaged in. And so, as promised, I will mention three teams to you. The first team that I would like to mention is the Applied Data Analysis Lab. Those are the guys who have the most text mining and data analytics skills um, at ICM. I will not have time to mention all of the things that they do, but let me mention two things. Um, ICM recently finished uh, a very interesting project in the area of analyzing judicial uh, court decisions, okay? So all of the courts in Poland theoretically, or by law at least, are obliged to publish their court decisions, but there was no one place which would bring all of those results together and perform analyses. The reason why I believe this is vaguely important is if you think about it, and this is a very hot topic for you visiting guests right now in Poland, one thing is what's written in the bills, one thing is how it's being interpreted in the field, okay? So um, I, I would argue that the latter is even more important uh, if you really want to understand what's going on in the legal system in a particular country. Yeah? So um, we've facilitated that. We've created a system which is collecting data from various kinds of courts, and we can perform analyses on top of that. The second project I would like to mention, um, and the reason I picked this particular one, the Common Map of Academia project, is that the other two things that are on the slide, so the content ex extractor and miner, so Kermine, a tool that we use for metadata ex extraction from scientific publication, and Coansys, so a, a framework for content analysis in general, are spin-offs of the first uh, project. In fact, because the picture on the right-hand side is smallish, I've expanded it a little bit. So Common Web of Academia is an idea that we would like to be able to show who is conducting research on what topic where. Yeah? So you can draw those kinds of conclusions from scientific publications, how they are citing one another. Um, you can query various other data sources to understand where, for example, projects are being financed. Um, you know, scientific publications, like we all know, are being published in, at a rate that nobody, even in their particular domain, can afford to read all publications. So we can draw some interesting conclusions if we apply machine learning algorithms, text mining algorithms, to analyze what is being published, what has been published, and all various other data sources to create a map of where research is going on. And uh, Martin, I paid particular attention to say research and not science, right? So I hope I scored the point. So this is the Applied Data Analysis Lab. The second team I would like to highlight is our Visual Analysis Lab. Those are the guys who are playing around with pictures and with volumetric images. Now this is the, for you, ladies and gentlemen, maybe less interesting slide because this is where we are coming from. This is a team which has conducted most of their work together with doctors, manipulating medical images, helping to plan procedures, understanding what is in the, in the images, etc. Um, Bartek Boruski, who is heading this team and is nervously sitting in the last row because he is afraid that I would promise too much, he likes to say that the team is going 
both ways. They are sometimes starting with data and they are making scientific visualization based on the data they have, but sometimes they, they, they go the other way as well, or many times they go the other way as well, where they start from images and start to draw conclusions from the volumetric images, how they compare to one another and how modeling can be applied to enhance understanding. So uh, the, meanwhile, they have, they have um, done a really nice portfolio of projects, not just in the medical space, but also visualizing various different kinds of data sets. In fact, one project that I would like to mention in a second will have something to do with rendering historical monuments and how you can use uh, real-time ray tracing to walk around old, 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 old buildings. But before I do that, um, um, I will get in trouble if I don't mention that over the years they have developed their own visualiz visualization package so that their interesting methodologies can actually be put into a tool which can be made available to people who are domain experts, not necessarily experts in computer science or visualization. So, uh, so stay tuned for use cases in, in the arts and humanities. The second slide, which is more interesting to you guys, is the kind of stuff that these guys can do, because hopefully if we, if we bang our heads together, we can find some interesting use cases uh, in your particular fields, yeah? So we mentioned a couple of times, I already mentioned a couple of times, the idea of searching through images, searching through volumetric images or 3D objects, comparing them to one another, drawing conclusions from their differences. Um, I don't know, how many of you are here from the arts, for example? Not really, okay? Anybody f interested in studying sculptures or paintings? Ah, perfect, three people. So imagine that uh, we, we could jointly browse through a set of sculptures and try to compare them by shape or compare them by technique. Would that be interesting? Excellent. Thank you for being with me. So, so there's a lot of stuff that we do, not just with visualization, but also visual analysis. And uh, like I said before, we do have some cool toys, but we have even cooler people that are really smart, have experience, and are hungry for new challenges. So that was the second team, visualization. The third team is the team that is running the Open Science Platform. Um, so those are probably those people who you know best. In fact, Kubash Prot, who, as you know, uh, cannot be with us today because of health reasons, he's the leader of that team, and they do amazing stuff when it comes to managing large data sets. They are the ones operating the recently announced repository for open data. Um, those are the guys who are, um, in fact, because Daria was mentioned so many times, um, and, and thank you for that, because that makes my job a lot easier. I have only one slide which basically says, yes, in Poland we also do that. In fact, the University of Warsaw is coordinating and Kupa is playing a vital role. And meanwhile, we are also, um, Poland is also a member of the European Daria, Daria Eric. So I will not mention this and I will not mention open air because I hope Martin will mention it. In fact, he did briefly. So there is a lot of projects that this team is doing which has something to do with making data sets available, but they most importantly, they have competence, they have skills, they have knowledge regarding uh, legal issues, technical issues, issues with getting different groups of people to understand one another. So, so they do amazing stuff, they organize events like the one today, um, like the um, conference on open research data and its implications for science and society, which you can see behind me on the right hand side. So this is this third team that I promised to show to you, a team has a, which has experience in managing data sets, curating data, giving advice, putting in place mechanisms that can serve data to really large groups of people. So Daria, I mentioned, now we come to the point of, okay, I told you we have some toys, I told you we have some teams of people that are really awesome, now what can we do together, okay? So what we do at ICM, so ICM, the, the, the largest part of ICM's funding is coming from external projects. Sometimes those, pro those are projects which we come up with and we look for partners on the outside world, but just as often those are projects which are born outside of ICM, but people come to us because they need skills, they need tools, they need methodologies, finally they need infrastructure to run those kinds of projects. So we survive on externally funded projects, and I would love to see some uh, follow-on projects, some additional projects which are also in the, in the space of uh, digital humanities, arts, and social sciences. So consider this to be an invitation. This is a very interesting time. We have European calls, we have Polish calls. The digital humanities are very high on the strategic smart specialization strategy agenda of both the European Commission and also the individual countries. So I think this is also not just an interesting area because we can do interesting stuff together, but this is also an area where money is being invested in. So it, it makes it a lot, a lot easier. 
And another thing that we are also doing at ICM, and uh, I know that the humanities can also play a role here, are commercial projects for the industry and business. Yeah. So if 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 you have a good understanding of the natural language and natural language processing. Everybody is very interested now in understanding what their company's opinion is in the internet or how to manage uh, hate in the internet comments or um, how to draw insights from scientific publications. It has been done in the more scientific domains. Why not apply to the, to the social sciences? Um, yes, another thing that we do is we do provide access to our infrastructure. So this was also a sort of invitation that the new facility and new site is going to, is going to run projects on a grant basis, on a project basis, so people can use our infrastructure. They can come and make use of, or, or we, we can contribute our infrastructure to those kinds of joint projects. And finally, just like you remember from, from the Center for Computing in the Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. It's also important to um, do education and training. In fact, we do that in, let's say, two branches, okay? One branch is we provide training on particular tools and methodologies, but we also do trainings in particular domains. So to those people who do not have the ambition to become computer scientists, but they would like to understand how to do visualization, network analysis, what have you, in their particular domain without becoming experts in code development themselves. Yeah. So just to manifest this as an example, those are the two most recent trainings that we have done. One of them was from the Apache Spark ecosystem, and that was more a, a tool instrument programming framework training, Okay. whereas the other one, <clears throat> the um, network analysis, Use, it, it happens to be using R, but this was by no means a training of the R environment, but this was showing people how we can do, this course is designed to show how we can do network analysis um, in, in a particular environment. Um, we reach out uh, to everybody, anybody who's interested. In fact, we also run a, um, a data science meetup, because again, data science is sort of the next big thing. Everybody is interested how data science can play a role in their particular area. I'm sure that uh, the digital humanities and arts are also a great example. Um, I'm very sorry, but this slide is already out, up, uh, outdated. Uh, this morning I had to update the number of registered users to 1,000. It happened this morning. But five minutes ago I checked again, it's 1,001. So I have to update it because, you know, 1001 sounds magical, like the fairy tales, right? And also it's a more legitimate number because if I told you I ha we have exactly 1000 people, you would think that I made this up, yeah? So we are meeting on a monthly basis and we have, we have very interesting speakers from our uh, partners, collaborators, or just people from the industry. Um, I, 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 I can already say that we have some prospects also from the digital humanities that we are planning to invite for the next meetings in the beginning of next year. So, so, this, so this is, let's say, our give back, our education, our seeding, if you will, with the hope to find some inter interesting ideas. Now, I started with uh, maybe a not very formal thought of me being very happy about those two worlds becoming together. So I will, um, mm, I will take the risk of also closing with a not very formal slide, which is this one. Um, and this is really what I mean. Yeah, I, I, I could not excuse in 2015 not to have a picture of the time machine uh, on my slide. Um, but on a more serious note, I mean, I know we talked about the fourth paradigm. I know we talked about ex um, data exploration as you know a breakthrough thing. We are already thinking about the fifth paradigm, okay, and about the next stuff that is coming in the form of cognitive stuff, cognitive computing, where it is no longer going to be us asking the questions, but it is going to be something or some system or some entity um, giving us hints, yeah? So, so uh, this was not a report on what we have done. This is a report of where we are heading. And in fact, like I mentioned, this is an invitation. I hope that we are going to have some interesting discussions shortly, which is why this is my last slide. In fact, no, I also have one more because Litka promised to me, uh, asked me to explain where I have all the pictures from, but never mind. Uh, this is the last formal slide I would like to show before we go to the discussion. Feel invited. Like I said, this is one of the most important presentations I have given this year because I know that we will do, that we can do interesting stuff together. Um, and I think in a, in, a, in a place where things are just getting started, the most, uh, the most breakthroughs can be achieved. So I hope this is an invitation that you will make use of. Um, I'm done with my presentation and I think, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>